gods of stone, gruesome title. Gods of flesh means gurus, and gods of stone means deities, the embodiment of divinity in India. And this was delivered at a conference of scholars, Indian scholars, and then was, the lecture was expanded and included in this book uh, of this title. Uh, so that's this one. I want you to read them in this order. Uh, of course, th these, these don't really come up until the end of the course, but I thought I'd give them to you now, and you can just start nosing your way through them. A lot of these are, this is really to explain, I set out to explain deity worship. But the first thing I had to explain to understand deity worship is that God has form. So then I had to explain, you know, that, that you can't understand deity worship if you think we're Mayavadis. And they'll never understand it, at least they can understand that our position has got some plausibility. So I found in the course of explaining deity worship, having to give a certain kind of argument against Mayavad philosophy. And I came up with a certain argument based on stuff in Prabhupada's books, which is in here. This karma, jnana, bhakti, uh, as, a, as, a, as a progression of spiritual development that puts bhakti higher than jnana. Uh, <clears throat> so that's in here. These are in chronological order, by the way, that I'm giving them to you. The next uh, is excerpted from, uh, it, it was published uh, in Back to Godhead magazine in two sections. This was a paper that I delivered at the uh, conference in 86 for the synthesis of science and religion in Bombay. Uh, and this is more, it's supposedly about synthesizing science and religion, so the claim is the only platform that can happen on is bhakti. So again, that's a rather elaborate uh, argument. There should be two of those, part one and part two. This was published in Back to Godhead, which... Which don't you have? You have an extra part one. Uh, and uh, this is a little helpful because it's got summaries at the end of part one. Plus it's got a little, second part has a little sidebar I wrote explaining some of the history, the enlightenment and the counter-enlightenment that are referred to in that article. Then the third article that you have uh, was delivered last year in March at the University of Minneapolis at a conference on interreligious dialogue. Uh, there was about 30 r scholars from all over the world representing all different religious traditions, so I was there. And uh, we're supposed to tell how our tradition views other religions. So that w that's what that one is about. That's being published by in a book by the... Uh, State University of New York, SUNY, Bingham, Binghamton uh, Press. Uh, so otherwise it hasn't been published anywhere. Uh, but was, uh, you know, a simpler version of that paper was delivered at that conference. Again, the same thing. Uh, I found myself in a position while explaining our view of other religions to again deal with Mayavad philosophy because people think that the only way that you can really have a, you know, uh, uh, open-minded philosophy of religions is really to be a Mayavadi. Everybody's got their own different symbol, but really it points to the same, you know, abstract, featureless, absolute truth. Yatomat tatopat. That's their slogan. So I wanted to make a case that this is uh, this is sabotage and that it actually sabotages religion and that there's a theistic basis that allows also for recognizing religious diversity. So I'm giving you those. It's not exactly that I'm going to examine you on these things that I wrote, except I'll go over all the different arguments at the last section of this course. But just to give you an idea of one way to do things uh, as far as you know, dealing with uh, Mayavad philosophy, I said there's a lot of stuff in there that don't directly deal with Mayavad philosophy. It deals with other things, so you can just, you know, don't have to worry too much about that, but try to zero in on the, the places where it actually deals with, with Mayavad philosophy. Okay? Okay. Now, let's get back to Shankaracharya and Parinama Varda, Vada and Vivarta Vada. <coughs> This is really the crucial uh, uh, 
section here, Shakti Parinama Vada. What does it mean? Who remembers? Transformation of energies. It refers to the actual doctrine taught by Vyasadeva, Parinama. Remember, it's in the Sutra. And uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Brahman isn't transformed, but it's the energies that are transformed. Uh, and we have two main arguments. One is the, uh, which he, he gave already, one is the nature of Brahman, is that he's so complete that even though so much energy comes off of him, he remains uh, unexhausted and unchanged. Unfortunately, the example that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uses to illustrate this to the sannyasis of Benares is not really very useful to us today. Who remembers the example he gave? Yes? Touchstone. Touchstone. Usually use examples to explain the less familiar by the more familiar, but as people don't accept the existence of touchstones, we can't really use that example very well. Another example is that of the sun, which also has its difficulties. Because although so much energy comes out of the sun, the sun still remains the same. But of course we know that actually, imperceptibly, the thing is running down. Huh? But the spiritual situation is that imagine a sun that even though you know so much energy came out of it, it never ran down. He's not getting more energy from anywhere else. But still, although so much comes out, he never is depleted, remains full. This is the nature of Brahman. As Prabhupada put it, one minus one equals one. One plus one equals one. This also happens to be, by the way, the characteristic of infinite sets. Georg Cantor, a mathematician, did the mathematics of transfinite numbers. And uh, it works. If you have an infinite set, if you take infinity and you subtract from infinity, you still have infinity left. There's a number of uh, examples Sadaputta gave that are interesting, but I don't have the time to go into it here. If somebody wants to know, I can tell you outside of class. But that's one argument. And the other is the idea that the energies themselves uh, undergo change and transformation. It expands and winds up, expands and winds up, but Brahman himself remains uh, unchanged. Uh, that's Shakti Parinama. Denies... What Shankaracharya assumes, as we saw in his, his uh, commentary, that if there's parinam, then Brahman would not be changeless. What's the Sanskrit word to, that he used for changeless? Kutashta. Brahman is kutashta. This kutashta would be compromised. Uh, yes? Yeah, because Nirguna Brahman has no energies. How does he conclude that? Because it's uh, described in so many ways as being related to nothing, as being unchanging, as being one alone, uh, consciousness without an object, and so on and so on and so on. He bases it on impersonal scriptural uh, discussions and also on his spiritual experience, I'm sure that when uh, one encounters the impersonal Brahman, one has the experience. There's not actually that the distinction in the impersonal Brahman is that the distinction between knowledge, the knower, and the act of knowing disappear. It's not really knowledge. I mean, I don't know what knowledge means. Knowledge means three things, knowledge, object of knowledge, and act of knowing. But in the so-called knowledge of Brahman, there's not even that. So what it is exactly, it only... Uh, but anyway, so this is his idea. He doesn't accept uh, that Brahman has energy. As soon as you talk about Brahman as having energies, you're over here. You're talking about Saguna Brahman. Uh, immediately. Uh, you, this, is avidj this is the avidya side of the thing, huh? Yeah, I'm not talking about reality. I'm talking about what, he, what he's putting down. Now, what I want to try to explain to you today is how tricky this theory is because my conviction is that in the course of setting all this, Shankaracharya does a very interesting thing. 
is that he sets up this distinction, you know, on the basis of Vaivartavada, uh, of these, these two levels of this lower and higher Brahman. And then if you look at the thing, it self-destructs. And so by destroying his own system, he manages never to blaspheme the Lord. I want to make the case that this Saguna Brahman is not Krishna or Vishnu as we know him. This Saguna Brahman here is a materialistic idea of Vishnu, that is to say, the universal form. That's what he means here. That, that this does not act, this represents a certain understanding of the Vedas which he rejects. And then he puts this opposite understanding next to him. And what we'll find out is in his philosophy there is no relationship whatsoever between these two ways of understanding. You can't get from one to the other. It's absolutely impassable. And then you think, well here we have a system that's preaching absolute unity and we got this total duality between these two. It has to be wrong. And this, this whole distinction has to be a product of avidya. So if avidya goes away, it's not that this is a product of avidya, but this distinction. Because it's after all, it's discursive thought, right? It's name and form. And so when this goes away, if you sit and you meditate on try this and try to understand what is like the non-duality between Saguna and Nirguna Brahman, then you're going to get Krishna. Because if this represents form, right? Here's form, material form. And remember, when he talks about Saguna Brahman, he means God with material qualities. And when he thinks of the highest Lord possible, he's thinking of the universal form. When the Mayavadis worship Vishnu as set up by Shankaracharya, they worship, Prabhupada calls it materialized Vishnu. Doesn't he use that phrase? Philosophize Vishnu. But it's the universal form. That's what it is. So here's one thing, then here's a negation. No form. You see, now this no form, Prabhupada says this quite distinctly. It's in, it's in, it's in the purport in Isha Upanishad. I left the book over there. That these, this negation being the opposite number of the relative material names and form is therefore itself also relative. So all you get from here is also a materialistic, another materialistic idea of the absolute truth. So this system self-destructs. It's actually, as, as, as a piece of uh, constructive philosophy, it sucks. Because, because you've, got this, you've got this gap. You've got this wall here. There's, if, you ask, if you ask in Shankaracharya, like theology, always, the central problem of theology is always the problem of what is the relationship between God and the world. It's always that. And even subordinate to that is the question of how we know God. Uh, because if we're in the world and God's outside the world, the relationship between the God and the world will have something to do with whether we have access, how much access we have or don't have. So, if you, ask, if you ask yourself the question, what is the relationship between the world and Nirguna Brahman? There isn't any. Actually, you can't ask the question. Because as soon as you say relationship, bang, you're over here. You see, they're going to want to say, you can't, you can't raise the question. Watch out for philosophies that don't let you ask certain questions. <laughs> They're because yeah, and because it's a hiding. Because they man, I told you before. They yesterday, they are able to the fallacy of shifting the ground. They can always shift the ground. You know, they can always shift ground. So this is this is what's actually being pulled off. You see, so so. But when he talks about this, my conviction is anyway that when he talks about when he talks about Saguna Brahman, he does not mean. Krishna with transcendental name, form, qualities, pastimes. No. 
He means a materialized philosophical, some kind of idea of God as having material qualities. And that's the way he describes it in this, uh, when he talks in the uh, Vedanta Sutra here, one one eleven. As long as it is the object of nescience, this is the nescience part, avidya, there apply to it the categories of devotee, object of devotion, and the like. This is page 62. The different modes of devotion lead to different results, some to exaltation, I don't know what the Sanskrit word that's supposed to translate, some to gradual emancipation, I think exaltation may be going to the higher planets, I'm not sure and some to success in works. These modes are distinct on account of the distinction of the different qualities and limiting conditions. So in other words, he's talking, you can Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, who you worship, the different demigods, you achieve different results. All this is concerned under Saguna, Brahman with different qualities. But they generally take as, you know, the highest... The Maya bodies always understand that the highest revelation of God in the world, or as we saw in Sadananda Yogendra, collective, you know, ignorance viewed collectively, is Ishwara, and that's the universal form. And then some particular incarnation like of Krishna, that's some, you know, that's some uh, Jiva who's, you know, become God, which is nothing extraordinary since they're all God, you know. That's the generally their view of things. Yeah? What's the, what's the argument or what's the uh, process for achieving that study? Of what? Well, this, this, is, this study is all undertaken, you know, in, in a course of asceticism, withdrawal, very strict, tapasya, brahmacharyena, samena cha, damena cha, you know, all these things are going on. There's withdrawal of the senses, there's study of this. And this system, for those people who are under this, just if you read Swami Nikolananda's and most Mayavadi commentators, they accept this two-tiered system. They accept, as Brahman is either, you know, they accept the lower truth and the higher truth. And they do not inquire, what is the relationship between these two truths? They don't really inquire. What is the relationship between these two truths? How can you hang these two truths together in one coherent philosophical system? The obligation of every philosophical systemizer is to be coherent. And this is just like totally incoherent. This obviously reflects somebody's spiritual experience. That here they are going on a sort of karma kanda, ishta devata worshipping, guy who thinks of God and when he thinks of a person God is having sort of like material qualities, names, forms and so on. And then there's another experience you know where all that goes away and there's an experience of bliss and knowledge and oneness and everything like that and all this while you're in this experience vanishes. It ain't there. Then this experience goes away and here you are back here again. You see? And you don't know how you get from here to here. There's no passage. There's no passage, you know. It's just like, boom, all of a sudden you're in this state. Because this Nirguna Brahman has no relationship with the world. It doesn't emanate the world. Because you have to ask yourself, how does this illusion occur, this vivarta, right? Illusory superimposition, right? That's what we talked at. Uh, it's ignorance. Now we, we ask ourselves, okay, whose ignorance is it? Here it is, there's ignorance. Whose ignorance is it? Is it the jiva's ignorance? No, because the jiva is the product of ignorance. Well, who's left? Brahman. Oh, well, wait a minute. Brahman is jnana swarup. His essential nature is knowledge. How can he be ignorant? So yeah, whose ignorance is it? That's why they got to have this say, well, actually, it doesn't exist. Ignorance, ignorance yeah. 
It cannot be described, as I mentioned earlier, it cannot be anirvachaniya, right? That's their term. Did you get that one? Hmm? I think it only has one in. Anirvachaniya. This is Anirvachaniya. Uh, cannot be described. By which they mean they cannot be described either as existing or as non existing. Because if you describe it as existing, then you got this problem. You know, you got Brahman compromised by ignorance. But if you say there is no ignorance, well, then the world is real, right? It's just, there's no illusion that's here, right? So they got to have it. And Swami Lankananda is real cute here. He says, he glosses this uh, Sadananda Yogendra. He says, uh, ignorance is described as something positive. Bhava, uh, bhava Rupa, uh, they use the term. It has to be it's po something positive. He says, Ignorance is different from reality and unreality as neuter is different from masculine and feminine. Well, that's a really <laughs> illuminating analogy. <laughs> anyway, really, this ignorance can never be properly explained. This is, you know, an advocate of Mayavad philosophy. It has found a place in the Vedanta philosophy in order to explain the otherwise inexplicable production of the phenomenal world. See, because in principle and in theory, it doesn't exist. But damn it, there it is. <laughs> and it's all ignorance. It's disgusting. It's full of names and forms and, you know, nasty things and fruit of work and pain and suffering. But there it is. It doesn't belong. So we posit this, you know, beginningless avidya. And we say, where, what happens? Well, it's, it's there through this vivarta illusion, or uh, the technical term they use uh, to explain Ravarta is this uh, superimposition, hmm? Ar uh, Ajaropa, huh? Ajaropa, yeah, A-D-H, Yaropa, and there's another synonym that you see too, A-D-H, it's an A. Adhyasa. These are the things. So here it is, you know, this, this illusory superimposition. Now, let's think about that a little bit, you know. Let's think about illusory superimposition. How does this stuff, how does this come about? You know. Well, uh, if you look at, you know, cases of illusory superimposition, we'll use the two standard cases. You mistake a snake for a rope, and you see some uh, conch shell lining, uh, a conch, and you see uh, you know shell lining, and you see which is mother of pearl, and you see silver, right? Now, so when there's a uh, this happens, first of all, there's the object superimposed. There's a snake. You saw a snake, right? And then you had some experience in your past of that snake. Right? Then, when you saw the rope, the image of the snake came into your mind. That had to happen. And then you had to identify this mental image in your mind. You had to superimpose it upon the snake, the rope. Right? All that had to happen for you to see it. And then, you know, you see this cobra sitting in the corner in the evening when it's just a coil of rope. Now, so to see a rope as a snake, a snake must have been experienced in the past. So if we see uh, the illusion of a world or the illusion of, you know, God is part of this illusion, the illusion of the world includes God in it, uh, that requires the existence of a world. Where did the idea that we superimpose come from? Uh, Shankaracharya, there's his pro you can say spiritual world. What can Shankaracharya say? Well, he could say from a previous illusion. I think probably this tactic has been used, right? 
you had a previous illusion, you're superposing your previous illusion to create a... So this never... And then you can have an infinite regresses of illusions. In the, in the first... Well, there was no first. It keeps on going, you know. Or it's one timeless illusion. It doesn't answer the question. Well, you right. can say well not inconceivable. On your question. <laughs> When you ask that, no, 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 you understand this it doesn't exist, actually. The world really doesn't exist. And that person can see, well, why do you think it does exist? Uh, that's avidya. But when you have the experience of knowledge, then the world is not there to bother you with this question. When you're enlightened, you won't ask this question anymore. The fact that you answer this, ask this question, why does the world exist or where is it, is, is it just shows that you're in ignorance. Shankaracharya shouldn't have written his philosophy. Actually, it's a fact. The Mayavada philosophy, if you are really a good Mayavadi, you can't preach it. If they're actually consistent, it would have never been preached. <laughs> Why is that? Because one big contradiction. You know? It denies the reality of thought and speech. It says it, you know, so, you know, if that's the case, you should just shut up. I've used that argument. This guy came into the temple and says, you know, words are meaningless. Shut up! In that case, shut up! <laughs> it was revealed to him on LSD that words were meaningless. So then he was trying to carry the message and was having a little trouble. <laughs> yeah, what the... Uh, I'm trying to remember this. I remember Nikola Nanda explaining it to us. I remember at the time saying it was unsatisfied. The, oh, I, the question was, uh, well, if Brahman has no attributes, doesn't have these, does it have the attributes of Satchit and Ananda? And uh, what they said is that uh, they're not attributes of Brahman, but they're, they're his essential nature. Mm. Swarup. But obviously, it has to lose meaning, right? It has to lose meaning, actually. It has to. No, yeah, right. How is it Chit? Who, who has... Uh, you know, who has consciousness without an object? You know, obviously it has to lose its meaning. So, um, so it's seven, I <coughs> no, no, they always describe Brahman. They always here's Sadananda Yogendra. This is the standard Mayavad description of Brahman, which is taken from Shastra. Reality is Brahman which is without a second, and is existence, consciousness, and bliss. I mean, they're talking about now Nirguna Bhaman. He says, he says, um, existence, that which is never limited by time and space. Consciousness and bliss. Unless the self he says it has to be conscious. Most beloved of all, sought after by everybody. That's all he says. Yes, theoretically those words wouldn't work. How can you say it's a hoitiki? Hoitiki and um, just, just pure bliss. Hmm? Well, they did not, but, but he, what he's saying is how, how, can, how can these words actually apply to... Nirguna Brahman. Anyway, it has something to do with making a distinction between not being the attributes and being the essential nature. But I don't see how that still clears up the problem with the meaning of the words. Anyway, then, you have another problem with superimposition. These are Jiva Goswami's arguments I'm giving you, by the way, so they're authorized. He says that uh, for illusory superimposition, there must be some similarity. For example... Uh, between a rope and a snake, there's a similarity in form. And the sinuosity of the rope allows you to impose the quality of the snake on it. Or there's some similarity in color between a, a mother of pearl and silver. So he says, therefore, he says, Nirguna Brahman, what, what are the similar qualities to have an illusion imposed on it? It has no qualities. So that won't work either. So these are some of the arguments that are, uh, that are given uh, against this Vivartavada. It just doesn't work. What are those arguments of Jiva They're in the Satsandarbha. Yeah. They're in Satsandarbha. O.B.L. Kapoor in his book runs them down. 
I find him confusing in places, but in other places he's clear. If you're not careful, you might get a little confused. But he, he mentions these. Many of them should show up in Prabhupada's books also. The chapter, Prayers of the Personified Vedas, has some of them in there. And so on. Anyway, the main thing is then, if, if you look at this two-tiered system, you actually see that there's no relationship between these two ideas of Brahman. You know? He says, this, this is okay to think like this so long as knowledge hasn't appeared. When knowledge appears, this is what you get. But this distinction is itself a product of nescience. And it's unreal. So if you look and you see that Shankaracharya is actually a great devotee of Krishna, and he put down the system to bewilder everybody, but he would never himself blaspheme Krishna, you can understand that if you get into what's actually going on, he set this up so that this Saguna Brahman isn't Krishna, isn't the transcendental Krishna. There's no notion here of transcendental form, right? It has to be. Philosophize Vishnu, universal form, demigods, whatever. But not Krishna himself. And then he puts as this opposition, this whole conception. And both are relative. So if you, st if you see here, and then if you're meditating on this a lot... Anyway, this is what happened to me. I was studying Shankaracharya when I ran into devotees for the first time. And, and I had realized, reading Shankaracharya, that even if the world is Maya, and if I'm in Maya, if you're in Maya, you should still worship God. You know, it's <laughs> that you should worship God. And I realized that I had to worship God. And then somewhere along the line, thinking a lot about Shankaracharya, I realized that this opposition between Saguna and Nirguna Brahman had to be overcome. And there's no way in the system to do it. It's just not, it's not coherent. It's just an absolute division. You can't get from one to the other. And so you say it sort of comes like a, you know, like a Buddhist koan or something, one hand clapping or... or uh, and so on. It's just completely, totally self-contradictory system. So that uh, when I began to hear from the devotees about Krishna, I realized this is what he's talking about. That when this whole thing collapses, when you get the idea of spiritual form, you have a synthesis of these two. Because if you want to say, you know, what has form and no form at the same time? It's spiritual form. Uh, there's form, but it's not material form. From, the, from a material point of view, it's not imaginable. It's just a sheer contradiction. But, uh, so then I said, that I went back to the temple and said to the devotees, you know, hey, you know, you keep putting Shankaracharya down, but I think he was really a devotee. And they said, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's Lord Shiva, he's a great devotee. So, uh, I think he did something very, very clever. And uh, if you really get into this Mayavad philosophy of Shankaracharya, you see it actually it has to self-destruct. It blows itself up. Otherwise, you're left with an incredible dual, for a system that advertises itself as being non-dual dualism. Non-dualism. You've got an incredible dualism. No way to get between these two. Well, there's no relationship. There's no ontological relationship. There's no psychological relationship. There's no epistemological relationship. There's no relationship. And the whole world is like totally and 100% disvalued to the point of being practically non-existent. As close as you can get to non-existent as you can. Yeah. Besides the philosophical discourse and analyze of the philosophy, which proves its or like you say breaks itself down, how would you analyze the mentality of the persons who have practiced one or the other form of impersonal uh, practices have come to a certain experience which they seem in their communications to the world? present 
in the form of impersonal philosophy, mm -hmm. and some of them being un unaware of the philosophical tenets, like uh, one who's well known, like saying there's another creature, what's his name, Ram Ramananda Maharshi, is often quoted as, in, uh, as a, in your own person, who realize Brahman and his influence, by his influence, other realize. Mm -hmm. So, how would you qualify? The well, first of first of all, um, as you know, it's not that Mayavad philosophy is a hundred percent wrong. It's partial truth, and the difficulty is that a partial truth is taken as the whole truth. Usually, in philosophy, that's the mistake. There's usually something to it; otherwise, intelligent people wouldn't buy it. There's something people can grasp onto. So the Mayavad philosophy, up to a certain point, is quite true. Material names, form, qualities, and so on, don't attach to God. Uh, that uh, we're not our bodies. That's also a major tenet of Mayavad philosophy. That we falsely identified ourselves with the material body. Oh, I meant to point out to you, by the way, there's passages in there which talk about the actual meaning of Vivarta, the, the true meaning of Vivarta, when I superimpose my idea of myself upon the material body, that's the real Vivarta, how the jiva comes into illusion. So there's, there's some truth into what they say. You know? So that truth allows them uh, to be convinced and they may actually have spiritual experiences of impersonal Brahman. We say it's there. There's uh, something objective out there we don't deny the existence of impersonal Brahman. It's there. But what else you see when people get attached to this, obstinate, and then think that this Saguna Brahman actually applies to Krishna and to Krishna consciousness, that also there's an element of enviousness in it. Because this is the other aspect, the psychological aspect of Mayavad philosophy. We have a room in our syllabus to spend our a day on that, is this hostility or enmity toward Krishna, as the Prabhupada described. Uh, uh, when you say he has no form, no hands, no legs, no eyes, you're saying he's blind, he's lame, <laughs> he's deaf, he's dumb. Uh, there's hostility uh, toward the Supreme Personality of Godhead and a chronic uh, desire to avoid being the servant, or to think that anyone is categorically my superior. Uh, so this becomes a refuge from these people who are disgusted with the material world, but also disgusted with the idea of being God's servant. It's the little cave you can hang, hang out in, this impersonal Brahma Jyoti, and more or less ignore everything. That's how I understand it. But they do have, there's some reality under which they can lay claim. And that is, they do have experiences like this. As we'll see in the second part of our course, we'll, we'll see the claim that's made that this same mystic experience of impersonal Brahman shows up all over the world in all different traditions and therefore it must really be there. And therefore it's the highest truth to make that further a claim. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, claims that the Mayavadis have put out uh, to, to uh, uh, push their philosophy that everywhere in all different religious and cultural traditions you see people that have this impersonal mystic experience. Therefore, it's transcultural, it's universal, and therefore true. Of course, everywhere people have sex, everywhere people pass stool, there's lots. <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean it's... <laughs> Just because it's there doesn't mean we go for it. But uh, So I'm not... Uh, we shouldn't get in the posture of denying that people have these experiences because they do have them. Uh, but just because they have them and just because they're maybe very powerful and overwhelming doesn't mean that it's the highest truth. Okay. Um, if someone falls down and everyone is all one, then why doesn't everyone fall down? And if someone achieves 
Well, they do, really. Some Mayavadis say that there's only one jiva and all the rest are product projections of his mind. They actually, what is that called? Solipsism. Some are, to deal with this problem, they say there's only one jiva. There's only one embodied soul. All the rest are projections of his mind. Because it's true. You see, that once one person is liberated, all of them should be liberated. Or if one, you know, that's, that's a fact. In fact, no one is, there should be no bondage, there should be no liberation. Yeah, Goloka? When you use the argument that there are, in my bodies, you become uh, personalist, but that you don't have the other, uh, you don't have personalist to become in my body. I know one. Kirtanananda. <laughs> I don't know if he ever was, you know, personalist, but <laughs> I guess we, we could say that too. They would probably they would probably argue that their personalists became Maya bodies, but we could say, you know, they never were personalists. It's, which I, I suspect is the truth. Yeah. That's that that's of course is one argument that's used. That's that's the point of the Atmarama verse. There are people that have no desire for material name, form. You accept this already, that there's no attraction in their hearts for material names, forms, etc. And yet they are attracted by the name and form qualities, pastimes of Krishna. Then th therefore those are not material. They're spiritual. Why would such great sages, who are completely atmarama, uh, satisfied in the self, be attracted to these pastimes of Krishna? And we don't see that once they've engaged in hearing and chanting about them, they engage in so many... You know, if the stories of the gopis are just erotic tales, then the next thing you want to see is the person engaging in sex life. Normally, the result of listening to erotic stories is that one practices oneself. That we've seen. But you see that Vishwanath Chakravarti, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they can hear stories about Radha and Krishna, Krishna and the gopis, endlessly, and no attraction whatsoever, no arising of sex desires there at all. Why is that? They're not erotic stories. They're not stories of mundane sex life. Yeah. Um, I just think one of the really, uh, what might be the reason for this philosophy to be so popular. Uh, I just think, is it possible to arise or to come to this determination through speculation, just by observing things yeah. that are going on around? And you, you, you can come to that sort of this, this kind of yeah. This is uh, when we get into Western philosophy. Uh, you'll see Plotinus, and really Plotinus is more what I think most people believe, certainly in the West and maybe really in India. I don't know how many people in India really understand Shankaracharya's actual philosophy. I mean, the, the, you know, the ones who really study Mayavad philosophy do, but the popular. But usually people think that there's a kind of impersonal, you know, Brahman, you know, Nirguna, who emanates, you know, the world we see around us. That's usually what they think. That's usually what they think. Uh, we'll, so we'll have to deal with that one. But generally the idea, anyway, we don't, we have to, I'm getting the high sign. Save your question. Why people come to this. And first of all, it's a generic, you know, it just it naturally happens when you turn away from, from, in disgust from the world and you start to look for something spiritual and you start to think about what God is like and you start to speculate, you're going to start to get more and more into something that's opposite from whatever you know and then no name, no form. You know, then how you work it out metaphysically, that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole another trip. Okay, we'll start on the Buddhist reading. We'll make it to the beginning of that tomorrow. Uh, this one here? This one? Uh, 11th day or so, 11th class. Plotinus. I'll give you some Plotinus to read and then we can, we can deal with that one. Thank you very much. Thank you.